And our Father and our God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come before you this morning. And as you have guided us and shepherded us throughout this week, you know our needs. And yet you long to have us verbalize those needs quietly in our own places of communion with you, silently as we would share in prayer together this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would continually help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of believing. We thank you that as we believe, you give us work to do, and we are privileged to serve you. And as we serve you faithfully, our Father, that you will, by your Holy Spirit, according to your word, give fruit in time. And we thank you, Father, for the harvest that is to be reaped, even as the Lord Jesus Christ will return. And as we work and as we wait and as we look forward to the coming of our Savior, we rejoice, our Father, in your marvelous plan to take us home out of this sinful world into a place of absolute holiness a place, our Father, no longer to be hindered by the world and the flesh and the devil, but, Lord, where we can serve you with a freedom and with a perfect service, and we know that your heart will rejoice in what you have done in and through our lives. Our Father, we come before you with personal thanksgiving for the way that you have cared for us, answered our prayers, met our needs, and uh, sufficed. Uh, our uh, wants and desires in the course of this past week. But we pray for others. We pray, our Father, for those in our family circles. Uh, Lord, not one of us here that does not have a family member outside of the, the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. And we pray, Lord, that you would indeed work and move through circumstances, through Uh, opportunities we would have to talk and to share as they would meditate upon your scripture, as they would hear your word. Our Father, we pray for their eternal salvation. And we pray, Father, that people may come to that place where they make that sure and sound decision that I renounce all of the past. I lay my sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. I trust in his shed blood that I might be born again and become your child. And then, our Father, with that great holy transaction, we become your children, and we then become employed in the great work of the kingdom as you would so direct and lead us. We thank you for the workers that are out there, and we do pray for our missionaries. Uh, We thank you for... Barry and Amy Speck and the whole work of Word of Life, and we think of their family and how you have blessed their parenting skills because each one of their children have not only come to know Christ, but they have been called into your work and they are looking forward and some are already engaged in spreading the gospel in the great move to reach young people for our Savior and train them in godly living. We pray, Father, that you would undertake for Hansa and Elise there in the Czech Republic meet their needs. Thank you for their zeal, for their enthusiasm, for their energy, and for the blessing that you have placed upon them. We think of the camps and the many young people that are being gathered together to hear your word in these days. And we ask that as a result of the sowing of the seed, there might be a bountiful harvest that would accrue for your honor and for your glory. We pray, our Father, as they plan to come and visit with us as the fall would come, that you would bless them as they go from church to church. They share of their story and of answers to prayer and of your great work in that needy, needy part of the vineyard. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed burden us all as we think of our mission field, which would be outside this church the moment we step outside the door, we step into our mission field. We step into the place where people need you and are lost and undone. And we pray, Father, that you, by your grace, would use our lives and our help and our love and our care 
and our assistance that they might know Jesus in a very personal way. Lord, we pray that you would undertake as well for those very personal needs that we have this morning. And as we pray for the sick and as we pray for those who are recuperating from surgery, as we pray for those, our Father, who sorrow and have lost loved ones, continue to meet their needs and to guide them that they might be aided of your spirit and deepened in their growth and commitment to know that you never fail. No matter what happens, no matter how dark the hour, you are always there to bring us through. So give us, our Father, that faith, that trust, that as we pass through this earthly journey, this pilgrimage, we do it by faith, and we know that you lead us every step of the way. Bless us that we might serve you and love you and honor you, and we give you praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning, I, I trust that you remember our time together last Lord's Day, and it was a great day of music, it was a great day of praise, and uh, we were reminded that we are involved in a race and as we think in terms of living out our life it is like a race but it is also true that as we have trusted Christ as Savior we are running a race we are serving him we are exuding our effort and our energies and our ability for his honor and for his glory through the Holy Spirit and according to the word of God. And so we think of those three words. You remember team, and you've got to be on the team, and then you have to be a believer in Christ to run the Christian race. And then we realize that as we uh, are part of the team, we have to be willing to train, and that's discipline, and that's exercise. And so we have the word of God every day. We have prayer every day. We share our faith. We reach out. We help. We minister even as the Lord Jesus did And then we look forward in faithfulness to triumph. And that great day of triumph is coming, and it will be like uh, no other time in all of history when we celebrate the wins that were possible, not just for one person in each of the categories of competition, but uh, all together we are competing against ourselves with what God's will is. We have a gift, we have an ability, and we serve him faithfully. And as a result of being faithful in doing what God wants us to do, we receive what crowns. And we know about those crowns as they are talked about in the two books of Corinthians. And uh, so we celebrate the greatness of the win. And uh, it is great to celebrate wins, isn't it? It's been a great time recently. You know, the generals won the Memorial Cup. Do we realize what that means? That is really a, an incredible thing. And it's right here in the in Oshawa area. And uh, we celebrate with them. And we uh, always achieve, always a, 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 are apprised of accomplishment. We always are aware of what it takes to really consistently go out there and produce uh, the goods. And then, of course, we uh, realize that the, uh, and we don't want to take anything away from the women, because the Canadian women's uh, World Cup team won yesterday against China, won nothing. And it was the captain of the team who scored the goal, one goal. And uh, so as they did it for Cincy, as they call her, uh, she was a, a, a great example of one who just carries on in the winning train, doing what's necessary and being disciplined and producing uh, game after game. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And lest we neglect the animals uh, a world among us, uh, we realize that uh, American Pharaoh won yesterday, and that was a Triple Crown win for horse racing, and as a result, it marked uh, the win, of course, of the Derby and the Preakness, and then the Belmont yesterday, which was the longest of all the races, which comes at the end of this uh, series of, of uh, runs, 
a mile and a half and uh, did it in uh, good time and won by five and a half lengths. And that is a time of rejoicing because of the effort and the training and all that has gone in. It's wonderful to win, and we want to be able to win, but we win in overcoming our own lives, our own disposition, our own plans, because we follow God's word. So as we turn to the word of God today, we realize that there are stress times in our lives and that the enemy is seeking to defeat us at every turn. And as he seeks to defeat us, he often succeeds. In fact, uh, sometimes we wonder if he doesn't succeed more than we do in winning for the Lord and appropriating the strength and the abilities and the resources that he has given us. And so what do we find over and over in the New Testament as uh, the life of the believer is to be strengthened and taught? We find we go back to history. We go back and look at the past. Do we learn anything from history? Not very much, that is for sure. We keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And God says, look, I want you to learn from history. And that is one reason why we read his book, because he has a special group of people, the people of Israel, called Abraham. Abraham's uh, ancestors became uh, the uh, great nation of Israel that we know of today. And as a result, they knew what it was to hear God and to follow God, but then to neglect doing what God would have them to do. And they were not always winners, they were losers. But can we learn by looking at the loss of other people? Why did they lose? Why did they not win? And then we mark it up and we say, now there is something I can profit from. And so that is what he is talking about as we come to the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He's looking at history the history of Israel, and he begins, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers, generations past, centuries, generation after generation, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And so he's talking about what? Deliverance from Egypt. And as they were 400 years slaves in Egypt, and that was due by God's discipline for their lack of commitment to him, they wandered off into idolatry and other things, and as a result, they were brought into chastisement or correction. And that is what a good father does for his children. He doesn't let them continue on and on, and it gets worse and worse. And so we look at the fathers of the Jewish people, and we learn. And all passed through the sea, and God was gracious in their greatest hour of need as he led them all the way from Egypt, and they came to the Red Sea, what? They could not get across the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was pressing in upon them to wipe them out, to destroy them, because Pharaoh had said, okay, go, leave, I give my permission, had a change of heart, and said, no, we're going to kill them all off. We're going to lose these uh, working people who helped us to build the uh, pyramids and the great buildings that we have here that mark our accomplishment, and uh, we'll make them pay. And as a result, God did a miracle. He opened up the Red Sea. They went over on dry land. As the army of the Egyptians followed behind, the sea closed in. And Pharaoh and all of his army were destroyed. And God freed his people once and for all from the bondage of sin and disbelief. And they look back upon that as monumental. And it is an encouragement for them to follow the word of God today. Now notice what he talks here. Did you find a word that's repeated over and over again in this passage? It's all our fathers in verse one. It's all passed through the sea and then all baptized unto Moses. All were identified with Moses. 
they were of the same faith. They listened to Moses. They followed Moses. They obeyed Moses, who got his word from God. And so the blessing in leading and provision and through the Red Sea over to the promised land was realized. And it was all. No one was left out. What, how marvelous is the plan of God? If you're part of God's people, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be honored and cared for. And uh, actually, they in the cloud and in the sea, and what was the cloud? The cloud that led them by day and the pillar of fire by night. The presence of God led his people. And God is always with his people. He'll never leave us, even in the darkest of hours. The presence of God to look after us and to bring us through. All of this, past history. Does God desert us today in our hour of need? In our time of trial, when we, 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 just, we don't have it anymore. We don't have the energy. We don't have the health. We don't have the ability. We don't have the means. We don't have the finances. We don't have the counsel. And you can't move into somebody else's life, into the lives of your children or your grandchildren, and say, you're doing the wrong thing. Let me make the decision for you. No. We are all in need of help beyond ourselves. And that help is supplied by God. All of God's people in Israel were cared for. They were identified with Moses. His presence was with them, and they did all eat the same spiritual meat. And even, and it is, it is, we read it as a story, and we say, well, that's another Bible story. But can you think of uh, leading two, two and a half million people from Egypt over to Israel, and uh, they are in all walks of life. You've got children. You've got pregnant women. You've got older people. You've got all these people, and they're all moving, what? By foot, by foot, by foot, step by step, through what kind of territory? Desert territory. And did they have time to pack a lunch that was going to take care? No. They had nothing but just the clothes on their back and uh, the supplies that God had given to them by way of teaching. And he said, I will look after you. Well, what are we going to eat? Well, God brought miraculous bread to fall down from heaven. And then as it mentions here, certainly you can't get very far without being hydrated with water. And you remember the occasion where God spoke to Moses, speak to the rock, strike the rock. And then the rock in this barren desert with the sun beating down upon them, they're absolutely dry, they desperately need water, and water pours out of this rock in flood proportions so that everyone has sufficient to bathe, to drink, to refresh themselves and are cared for. All drink the same spiritual drink. For they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them. And then Paul says, you know what the rock was? The rock was Christ, the Son of God. And so through Jesus Christ, we have everything that we need. He supplies our food, our drink, our health, our strength, our wisdom, our direction. Anything and everything that we require, God is there. And how do we know he does it? Well, let's look at is Israel alive and well today? How did God sustain them in this very difficult time? God did it, and he will do it for us. We learn from history that God is faithful. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. And this is the truth of being blessed and supplied and looked after by God. And then people say, well, I don't know whether I want to do this when God requests it of us or not. Uh, you know, I get tired of listening to God. I want to do my own thing. And this is human nature. We all want to be uh, people who are going to do our own will and we get ourselves into our own trouble and come crying back to God. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our, what, examples. 
this was a teaching for us today. Can we identify with those people? Now you say, well, their primitive way of life, they, they, they certainly, they rode camels, they walked, they had other beasts of burden, they didn't have vehicles such as we have. No, but the principle still applies. That in the face of need, in the face of moving us from place to place, in the principle of supplying while we are engaged in travel, when we are seeking to know how God will undertake for us, he will supply, he will look after every one of these details. But then he offers a word of counsel here. Do we learn by history? He said, remember why they got into Egypt into slavery in the first place, false gods. And do we have false gods today? We do. Anything that distracts a believer from a Christian lifestyle, anything that keeps you from reading the word of God every day, anything that keeps you from laying in an orderly fashion before your almighty God as a believer in Christ, your needs and praising him and thanking him, that whole exercise of prayer. And prayer has been described as breath. It is the breathing of the spiritual life as we relate to our maker, our savior, our provider, our God. And as we talk with him in prayer, Satan hates prayer. He hates the word of God. He hates anything that will help us to be winners and achievers for God. And so he says, now, let me just highlight some things here. He said, be careful of idolatry. Anything that comes between you and God and a godly lifestyle on a regular basis is really an enemy. It's an idol. It used of Satan to distract. He distracts and then he removes, and then he begins to work and to entice us that we get so far away from God and God's blessing and the place of his favor that judgment falls upon us and then we repent and we come back. And it's a cycle kind of life that we know. And he says, so neither be idolaters. He follows this uh, semantic treatment uh, over and over again. He goes on and he says, well, let me tell you another thing. He says, don't be guilty of immorality. Neither, verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and, tell, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. And you remember, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And so in the course of uh, the journey, and God says to Moses, now come on up here, we want to have a conference with you. And he took him up on Mount Sinai, and as a result, he gave him the Ten Commandments, the law of God. And as he was up there, and he was talking with God, and he was fellowshipping with God, and God took his finger and wrote out the Ten Commandments that are so foundational to any successful society in this world today wrote it out plain and simple, commandment after commandment. And he said, as this would be now, your guideline, your way of life, keep the law and you will be blessed. Break the law and you will be cursed, you will be disciplined. Very simple, very basic, but very foundational. All in New Testament times, a lesson from history going back. So he said, watch out for immorality because that is the way of this world. And we live in an immoral world. We no longer think that marriage is necessary. We just, uh, we hook up. And we hook up for whatever period of time it may be. And then when you decide, well, we have had enough of this, you unhook and you go and hook up with somebody else and so on and so on. And as a result, the whole of the family is destroyed. So we teach our children, you know, today in the new curriculum, uh, you know, some people, some children have more than one mommy. They have two mommies, or maybe they have three mommies. 
And so you have these three families that part or parcel are come together and you have these different women and you call all of them mother or you have more than one father. And we, how does that bring stability? How does that bring responsibility to parents in the care of their children and looking after them as individuals that are to be shaped and molded to know God, to love God, to do what is right? Everybody's responsibility is nobody's responsibility. And we wonder why we have such a, uh, an aberrant behavior among young people today. Well, we have no order. We have forsaken God. We don't need God anymore. We don't even need him in an, uh, an, uh, an offering of prayer in our governmental meetings. We don't need the Lord's Prayer anymore. Let's do something else. Let's sing the national anthem. Well, even in Canada, you got <laughs> God is mentioned, and we are, re, we are resting, at least in word, upon God to direct us and to keep us and to look after us. And so there is a move to take God out, and we're going to do it ourselves. Do we not see the absolute destruction of it all? Warnings, all from what? The past, history. History's taught us this. Where has any nation gone that has deserted their God, deserted his word, deserted prayer, deserted his teaching? They have been destroyed and they have failed miserably. And so he says, well, and this sort of is very common, but he said along with uh, idolatry, along with immorality, uh, watch out for those things. They'll trip you up. Don't get caught in that. And then he says, and do not become complainers. Look down in verse 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were, what? Destroyed of the destroyer. When you complain, and we, it, it's, it's not easy when things don't go your way and when the apple cart is upset and your plans are all awry, to be thankful to God for his guidance and his direction. And so as we think in terms of our own life and we plan and we say, but I thought it would work out this way. It doesn't. It's some other plan. But we have to come to the place where we say, Lord, uh, not my will, but yours be done. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And whatever the Lord allows, and he allows many things that aren't of his authorship, but he works it into his plan, just like he did with Job and Satan's attack upon that character. He took the discipline and the hardship of Job. He worked it around for a glorious end. And Job came out the winner because he would not forsake his God. And as we see complaining, whenever we complain in the course of life, and it is not always going our way, we are short, we are under duress, we are faced with problems and difficulties, and we begin to murmur and to put forth our negative thoughts and our, say a lot of things that we ought not to say and we sour other people and we become so harmful to our own families and our own society at large that God is like, he's not there anymore. God is in control. And though it isn't pleasing to us, we don't even understand it, yet all things work together for good to them that love God. Do we love God? Then don't complain. Say, Lord, give me wisdom to deal with these situations and these circumstances. And so complainers were what? Destroyed. They were wiped out. And then he goes on, now all these things happened unto them. And he said, now, do you understand how you fit into this. This is all past history. This is ancient stuff to you. You say, well, we're not there anymore. Yes, but how are you learning the lessons that you have for us to learn? Now, all these things in verse 11 happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our 
admonition. You're ready for teaching. You're ready for instruction. You're ready to know God's way for your life and the way of blessing and the way of peace and the way of prosperity with him and the meaning of every requirement that you will have. Then listen, this all comes out of history. It's already happened and now it's here it is, recycling again. But these were in samples, examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. Now, that's rather awkward, but it means upon whom the end of the age is the outcome. And so as we complain, we're going to not fit into God's plan or outcome. But as we say, Lord, you lead us, you have a reason for this, a purpose and a plan, and we are accepting that, show us what to do in light of these circumstances, and the outcome will be glorious. It will be successful, not according to our plan, but certainly according to our direction. So when difficulties come into our life and problems and so on, what do we do? Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Who needs God anymore? I can do it. I can do it. I'll be the one who changes things and makes them to work out. And uh, that uh, verse was personally uh, burned into my mind as I had a mother, uh, an adopted mother, who uh, when she would talk to me about this or that or anything that was realized by way of accomplishment or achievement, she would say, now remember, <laughs> him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And I thought, well, I'm not even thinking that. Well, you may not be thinking about it, but you may think about it in the future. But don't go there. Don't do that. And I thought of that over and over again. Anything that is accomplished, it's because of God who made me. He gave me ability. He gave me strength. He gave me wisdom. He gave me this and that. And all the glory belongs to him. I just follow the game plan. That's all. So we honor God. And then this marvelous, marvelous 13th verse. And uh, we should certainly burn this into our minds and our hearts and our lives. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted or tested or tried above that ye are able, but will with the testing, the trial, the difficulty, also make a way of escape that ye may be able to. To bear it. What a marvelous piece of truth and information that is to us. Where God is saying unto us, temptation and trial and difficulty, it's all allowed of me or authored by me, as the case may be, and God will see that you are cared for in your treatment. And so as we think in terms of uh, this trial, this temptation, this difficulty where we've got to make decisions, we've got to do something, we've got to act, we've got to behave according to the right way and the right thing, uh, we realize that we face over and over at different levels, in different times, in different types, and in different ways, all kinds of issues in our life. And uh, Satan is very, very clever because when he takes us into a difficulty, and he does have some authority to do that because of Job. God, Satan went, we'll read the early chapters of Job and you find Satan and Job and God got together and, and Satan said to God, uh, you know, Job uh, is, a, is a good man. He's a follower. He's a believer. He does what you want him to do because you blessed him. And he was a very wealthy man. He had a great family. He had everything that any, uh, this world could provide. But he was a godly man, and he honored God with what he had. And he said, that's the reason 
he is faithful to you because of what you've given him, what he has as a result of your goodness. You take that all away and he'll curse you. He'll turn on you. He'll denounce you. And God says, no, not Job. All right, let's put him to the test. We'll put him to the test. And God said, all right, Satan, you can do anything you want, but you cannot take his life. And so think of it. God controlled. He had the boundaries in place, and he could only go so far. But he stripped him of his family. All of his family died. You remember? They're having a, a big birthday party together there in the first chapter or whatever. And boom, they were gone. All these children at one swoop, done, finished, out. And then he took away all of his wealth. He took away all of his holdings. He took away all of his notoriety and his fame. And where does he wind up? He winds up on the garbage dump of the local city, sitting there, picking out of the garbage something to eat and keep his body together. And you say, and you mean God allowed that to happen? But see, what we don't see is that every temptation, every test, every trial is a contest. It's a contest between God and Satan. It's a contest between God's will and your will. And we make the choice. We make the choice which way we will go. And as a result, we know victory through the problem or we know defeat, and we allow it to break us and to destroy us. And so here, this verse is given unto us that we may understand that every temptation is a contest, and it goes far beyond us. And the older you become and the more you walk with God, the more you realize the things that happen in the course of our lives, our families, our world, our nation, all have to do with God at large. God is way ahead of us. He's got it planned. It's already in place, and it's being worked out according to his will, and we're just a, a cog in the process. Now, a very precious cog. God loved us, and Christ died for us and provided salvation for us, but it is a contest and we are being put to the test. Are we going to do it God's way and believe God and prove God is faithful? Or are we going to stumble and lay our loyalty at the feet of Satan? And ultimately be defeated and disappointed. And so he says, temptation is always a contest. And it always is important that we understand the working of temptation. And so how do we understand temptation? Well, we understand, first of all, from James 1, that temptation, which is solicitation to evil in this case, where things in our experience are set up to lead us to our downfall. It leads us in a way we deny God and we deny his help and we go our own way and we fall on our faces at the end. That this is let and allowed into our lives that we might understand how temptation works. Temptation never comes to push us to the point of failure. That kind of temptation never comes from God, James 1. Lest a man think that when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. He's never tempted of God to do evil. He may be tested of God to do good, to be a means, a testing, to strengthen, to make him a better and a more faithful believer. But he is one who is to profit as a result of the testing. So we understand this, this situation and then we think in terms of 1 John. And in 1 John, you remember in chapter 2, it's all summed up for us what temptation is about when it comes from Satan. And so here, John, the aged apostle, talks to his 
people and to us in verse 15 of the second chapter, love not the world, the world system, as it is today, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because the future and that which is lasting and enduring is not in this world. It's in the will of God and doing what he wants us to do and to believe him and to prove him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. That's, uh, that's the way we're made. We are made to live in a human body. And this body has a fallen control. We are made perfect in the beginning. Adam and Eve sinned and we were, we were then visited at birth, brought into existence in this world with broken equipment. And that old flesh is really working us over all the time. And it appeals to us in various ways. It appeals to the eye gate. It appeals to the ear gate. It appeals to the thought gate as you read or as you think or meditate. And it can be just as quick as a, a glimpse or a picture or a portrayal or a sound music that is really so uh, obnoxious to God and so anti-God that gets us into this fleshly uh, lifestyle. I mean, to think in terms of th this world where if a couple are making love together, they say, talk dirty to me. Now, what in the world does that do? That only br brings the whole relationship of love for each other, respect for each other, and the pledging of love to each other in a time in which we need to fill the tank with a sense of loyalty and support and encouragement and help and talk dirty to me. I mean, this is absolutely that we would be lowered to this kind of thing. That's the world. That's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's all about me and what I can do. And it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. But you remember this, that anything that the world okays and put their stamp of approval upon, it all passes away. It passes away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so when we understand what temptation is in its solicitation to evil, to make us to sin, to break the commandments one after another, uh, to, get, to become addicted, to uh, do things, uh, well, I don't have any money, I'll go out and steal. Or I'll, I'll, I hate this fellow so much, I will kill him. Uh, I will, you know, we, we find this working in our life all, every day. The reports come in of this kind of thing. No, this is so destructive and it is so damning to our eternal welfare. And so we understand something about how Satan is just tearing us down step by step, but he's, he's helping us to make the right decisions to walk down and to, be, and to become a fodder at his feet. And so what is the conquest? The conquest is to realize what this verse says. This verse is talking to us about in the face of temptation and solicitation to evil, the first thing you do is what? You run. You remember, that's what uh, David did not do in the Old Testament. He should have been out on a battlefield living, le leading his troops, and he's wandering around at home at nightfall on the roof, and he's looking for something to entertain himself, and he sees Bathsheba, and he steals another man's wife, and all of this brought great sorrow and heartache and d difficulty into his own life, and was a disgrace that he was a man after God's own heart and committed such a sin. But God is a forgiving God if we genuinely repent. And so it is uh, uh, very plain that as he uh, talks to us here of uh, our decisions and our wants and what we would uh, desire to have, that temptation becomes a time when we need to run. He needed to do what Joseph did in the Old Testament 
and when he was enticed of Potiphar's wife, and he ran. He got out of there. He lost his, uh, his cloak, he lost his robe, but he ran away, and he got out of there as fast as possible. And uh, we are too proud to run. I can handle this myself. You are no match for the destroyer of our soul, Satan himself. He's been in the business for a long time. And as I mentioned in the uh, adult Bible class this morning, you know, when Adam and Eve were fashioned, they were fashioned with absolutely everything was theirs. Perfect. They had everything they wanted in the garden. Everything was perfect except don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And into that perfect environment came Satan himself, and he enticed Eve with the presentation of, do you mean God wants to deprive you of powers of choice? That you're going to just do whatever he wants you to do? Why, that's very demeaning, isn't it? Where's your personhood? Where's your sense of value and worth in that situation? And you know, God's holding out on you. If you were to eat of that tree, you'd become like like a god. And you could do what God does. And he doesn't want any competition. And she bought into all of that. And we are no match for this seasoned killer, destroyer of our own souls, Satan himself. And so as we understand, we need to run. And we need to replace the activity with that which is good. And that is the great thing, that we are to turn to the Lord and we ask God for help. We turn to his word for strength and we replace evil with good. We meditate upon that which will build and help us. And we will then rely upon God, his word, and prayer, and we will also reach out for help. And this is why the church is so important. Where do you find, now I'm talking about not just any church, but a church that stands for the word of God and preaches the truth and teaches it week after week. This is where you're going to find the kind of help you need. There will be people who will pray with you, for you, There will be people there who will assist and give direction and aid in any way they possibly can. Where can you go in this world and find a company of people like that that is a resource? But if we forsake the church, we are casting our vote for the closing of the church doors. That church isn't all that important. I can skip and I can go out in the golf course, I'll have a game today, or I can go for this or that or here or there or whatever. No, no, listen, we need some boundaries and we don't want to let those boundaries just disappear. But we need to keep things in place and do what God tells us to do, that we may be strong, that we would be overcomers and triumphant and victors in the face of any and all temptation. And so it is that God has called us to victory, and he has given us the formula. We know who God is. God is faithful. He will be there whether we sink or whether we swim. He is there to forgive. He's there to restore if we truly know him, but we do not take it lightly. We do not take this as an opportunity because when we sin against the holy God, In time of temptation, we are casting our lot with the evil one, with the course of this world, and this is what Christ came to save us from. And so as we reach out, we not only have help for ourselves, but we have help for other people. And you need to come, and you need to come and share with our family. And if you do not know Christ as your Savior, with all that's happening today, And the fast movement of all these events that bring us up to the return of Jesus Christ very, very soon, then you are in great trouble. Decide for Christ, live for Christ, be faithful, and claim these promises. You will never find them to fail as we seek to learn not only from history, but from our own experience and God's faithfulness. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we just bow before you with thankful hearts for your love, for your goodness, for your care. And Lord, how wonderful that you tell us beforehand what will happen if we disobey. 
And Lord, you don't hide it from us. You let us know the full truth, the whole story from beginning to end. And we willingly, in fact, willfully, when we sin, turn our backs upon you. Oh, God, forgive us, undertake for us. And as we have failed and as we have let these things slip, we used to read the word of God each day. We used to memorize portions of scripture. We used to talk with you a lot more than we do today. And Lord, as we slip, we are losing our strength and our defenses against the evil one. This one who is an arch destroyer, who has supernatural power, we will never be able to cope. We must rely upon Christ and your spirit and your word, the sword of the spirit. So Lord, help us to avail ourselves of your truth and do your will, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen.